So, uh, okay, so this is, uh, uh, let me also introduce David Curley. Um, David is uh, with Thomson Reuters. Um, he is a uh, really, really one of the, I think, outstanding legal thinkers in our field. Um, he runs their technology division, uh, but he's a lot more than just technology, just like uh, our other speakers are. Uh, they're what I would call applied technology to solving some of our uh, profession and industries, thank you very much, uh, problems. So um, let me just um, uh, fire away. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to throw a couple of questions out, and then by all means we can uh, have the group. So. Um, uh, it seems to me that, you know, we keep coming back to culture, which I think is the, r the right place to be. Um, and, um, you know, I think that um, what it should tell us is that the different speakers at, at the conference come from different geographies, different parts of the legal ecosystem, but nonetheless, there is this convergence on the issue of culture. Um, David, let me uh, start, since you haven't had an opportunity, you've done a lot of listening, um, what is your take in terms of um, how we might meaningfully go about changing legal culture? Because as my friend Richard Susskind um, famously said, you know, how do you tell a group of uh, millionaires uh, that their business model is wrong? Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. And I think, uh, you know, it, 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 the, this culture theme has been going on for a day and a half now, um, and we're all thinking about it a lot um, and I think it's easy to get frustrated it's easy to point out the, the, the places where it's not working um, but maybe one approach is to focus on where it is working where it is changing where culture is starting to come around and I, and I can think of sort of two examples broadly speaking um, somebody yesterday mentioned clock the, the corporate legal operations consortium which is a, a place where that the aspect of culture that we're talking about, about the, sort of the d diversity of roles uh, uh, where the industry can, can let in professionals with other skills other than core legal skills, data analysts, the process managers, process engineers. Uh, on that corporate side, there's a, there's a culture developing. I mean, if you go to a clock conference, the, which by the way has doubled in attendance every year for three years, uh, they just met a couple of weeks ago, 2,000 people uh, attended. You, you sense a culture emerging there. There is a, is a, a culture of people who are determined to do their job a different way. And I think that might be the ultimate answer, is that some of that spirit is gonna rub off on, um, you know, the sort of the quote, mainstream industry, the, the law firms and the traditional clients. Another, another place where that culture is kind of coming around is, um, is in the alternative legal service provider space. I mean, there, it, it's easy to get hung up on when we, when we talk about lawyers and their characteristics, we tend to have this archetype of the law firm lawyer in, our, in, in mind. But there's actually an awful lot of lawyers and, and allied professionals working in, um, in alternative service providers where they're, they're integrating services and technology in interesting new ways. They're delivering new types of services. So I think there, there are examples of the culture piece coming together, and I don't, I don't think we should lose track of that as we you know, continue to vent our frustrations with the, the sort of the mainstream culture. Yeah, uh, I, I wanted to ask, thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about the uh, pipeline. You know, who's coming into um, the, um, let's call it the industry, okay? With apologies to those who say that it has to be referred to exclusively as a profession, but I'm using the term industry because I think um, it, it is broader and will include both, uh, as lawyers have long said, uh, both lawyers and quote non-lawyers. And I think that's something, uh, by the way, we should jettison non-lawyers and talk about you know, legal profession, professionals who may not have licensure as, as lawyers. So um, with that as predicate, uh, Marcus, you, um, I, I thought, um, had some uh, uh, great slides in your terrific presentation. One of which uh, captured my imagination was, you know, sort of the, the personality profile um, and the sociability. I, I, I don't recall what the exact word was. Uh, what, what was it? It wasn't sociability, but, oh, it was sociability, okay. Um, and, um, you know, Sarah touched upon this in, in her uh, comments uh, uh, with, uh, um, with you, Andrew, and I know um, 
Leslie, you know, you got the, the, the STEM kind of um, a, a program. We have these students in the room. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> great. Um, and uh, I, I'm just kind of uh, wondering to what extent, Marcus, I'll, I'll direct this to you, to what extent might we as an industry um, make very clear um, uh, that, you know, we are not only receptive to people with, you know, sort of different types of backgrounds, but actually encouraging them because we think that there is a terrific future for them uh, in the profession. Uh, I guess, uh, how, how do we go about on a broader scale um, getting the kinds of uh, students that you select? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering whether you were thinking about some sort of image, image ad, like, like the German army make, making image ads so that people join the army. Um, I mean, we have, to, as, as I said, it, it's a privilege to work at Bucerius and we don't have to, to do any marketing for us. So people come anyway. Um, we look at their social structure and mixture and make sure that everyone has a fair chance to get through this. So we have not given further thought to uh, attracting more people because uh, people from all parts of the world are coming anyway. Um, but what, what, I, what I can answer is, it's not so much a question of whether we encourage people to come or not, because they will be coming anyway. That's point one, and point two is, there is no way in saying, well, we appreciate this new generation with their skills and values, because they are that type anyway. So whether we like it or not, it's a question of live with them. And at the moment, we are very much in an early stage where traditional lawyers would say, ah, these young guys, they don't really want to work, no partner career, and they don't work hard enough, and they are so different. And so, so the typical teething issues. So um, if, if, if the industry would start to look at their structures and their attractiveness of what they offer, men and women and people of all sorts of di diverse backgrounds. Um, I mean, and John, you are, you are nodding because you know what it means with 9,000 lawyers to, to cater for all these different. That is, let, let's focus on that and not so much on the image campaign to invite more people to come because they will be coming anyway. It's still an attractive profession. Um, there are many countries where you get through law school or other types of education without being ruined after that. Um, and you can have a great time in, in law. So, so that's my answer to your Got it. question. Um, I'm just going to pose one more question and then throw it up to the audience. Um, and I'm sure there'll be lots of uh, spirited questions. So I'm going to direct this jointly um, uh, uh, to you, Laura, and, and to you, Andrew. Um, you know, as, as, as people who uh, are uh, part of a, a, a younger generation, um, and I'm just delighted because I can tell you that, you know, when I was at your stage of the game, uh, I, I did, you know, through improbable circumstances, you know, I was kind of a, a very young managing partner, and of course, everybody just, you know, just thought, what is this? You know, what is it? Does he have something on someone? Why is he here, sort of thing? You know? Um, because um, when I was a young lawyer, it was, you know, it's sort of like the post office. You know, it's you, how you are valued is largely based on how many years you put in. Um, and then, secondarily, once you get to the partnership, it's all about, you know, how much rain can you make? And that was it. Uh, and so uh, the fact that you you guys are, um, you know, a, a part of, uh, of, you know, the leadership uh, says to me that maybe the culture is starting to change. Um, I'm wondering what kind of, from your perspective, um, what kinds of advice might you give to the older generation um, that would actually get them to say, hey, you know, um, we can learn a lot from these guys, just as, you know, as they tell their war stories, they like to think, probably inaccurately, that you guys can learn a lot from their uh, war stories. So how, uh, what is it that you would say, you know, to, to the older generations 
um, that makes it clear that really maybe this is a part of an emerging culture. I'm gonna take great pride in doing this. I actually wouldn't say anything because I don't see us siloed by older generation, younger generation. So, you know, the way that I think the movement of, you know, the law and where a lot of areas are going is what is, what are you doing? And I think the idea that it's like we have to think about that person's older, that person's younger, that, I think that needs to go away. And so I think the advice that I would give is the same one that I gave earlier, just in general about doing stuff and getting out there. And I'm not just trying to say this to sound like, I don't know, like today I woke up and I had like really strong coffee and I want to be political all the time. But, you know, I just think that that's the way I genuinely think and we talked about that yeah. at Walmart. Um, one thing that I would say though is, um, while I, I love that we talk about age diversity, I also think we need to talk about ethnic diversity um, in the legal industry and in legal tech as well as gender diversity. Um, and so I think that that's uh, another uh, topic. And you know, legal tech is suffering from some of the same problems that law did. And you know, I, I saw something, I think it was yesterday, Bob Abroach had a tweet about a study that said there's, I think 13% female legal tech entrepreneurs right. in terms of founders, um, something like 3% Hispanic, something like 2% uh, black. Uh, and I think that's a huge issue, and I think we suffered from it as well at our company where we focus so much on ethnic diversity. I'm, uh, I'm brown and, and Gmail's black, so it kind of made sense to go that route. Um, and now we've really doubled down and trying to ensure that we hire more, more uh, folks from, from various genders, et cetera. Um, but I think we need to have these full conversations. So I'd rather focus on talking about different ethnic backgrounds, different genders, different everything, and, and us not have these set silos again. And, and by the way, I'm totally with you. Of course. I, I'm just saying that, um, you know, I, I think that the uh, intergenerational diversity is something that is very often, frankly, overlooked. Agreed. Um, and I believe that you're crazy not to have a, a younger generation on your management. I just want to say don't. one more thing. I don't think it makes sense to just rely on the young generation of digital natives right. to do all this change because they're not the decision makers. So you're telling people who have no decision-making uh, strength at a firm, at a law school, at an in-house team, why don't you guys figure out technology? But that doesn't make any sense. And so that's why you have to be very careful when you use terms digital native or these young generation. That you carry a study, which was fabulous to see, it's gonna take them 20 years to get to decision-making uh, levels. And in that, they're gonna have to eat so much fertilizer that they might not be able to actually have the same attitudes. So it, again, that's kind of what I want to say. Yeah, and I, I'd echo that. I, I don't tend to generally think about it in terms of you know, younger generation, older generation. That's, that's not typically the way we tend to think about it. And you know, what's, what's always interesting when we're going into firms and they're asking us to you know, come show them what, what our technology does is that we see interest, really strong interest across the board. It's yeah. not just people who are you know, the millennials. You get really senior partners who are, you know, perhaps even the strongest advocates there because they have a vision for, you know, what's coming in law and how this is going to benefit them. So I think it, it's not just about, you know, what do you do with your, your kind of youngsters in the firm. It's it, whoever's in there who's who's got a sense of what's coming and how we can adapt and, you know, who, who's pushing for that change. Back that person. Um, wherever they are in the firm, whether they're the most senior person or the mm -hmm. least, least senior person, I think. Um, so no, no specific advice for... Uh, oh, well, and um, I, I just make one comment that I guess I've shown sort of my uh, unwitting generational bias in the sense that, um, you know, I presupposed that maybe that would be the, the mindset, but, but I will say this, I, I think we are moving towards um, a, a, an era in our uh, industry where it's about expertise and who has the expertise? Um, who's got the expertise to solve problems, right? And, um, you know, it, when law was just about, you know, legal expertise, that was all it is, it just happened that the backstory of why, you know, I was able to have a kind of an uncharacteristically rapid rise is because when I was an assistant U.S. attorney, uh, one of the many cases that I tried was a class action that went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Nobody even knew what class actions were, right? So I had the expertise. Um, and I think that now, as law is not just about legal expertise, it's about technological expertise, it's about process expertise. You know, different people have the expertise. 
Um, and, and, you know, I think that the sooner we as an industry are able to acknowledge that and embrace it for the benefit of not only existing law clients, but those in need of what we can deliver. Um, Marcus, you were talking about, you know, the unfortunate situation of the blowback from, you know, sort of the German bar in terms of, um, you know, a, a blowing back to steps that could be taken to improve access to justice. I think these are the kinds of things that we, you know, really need to tackle head on. And I think people have to understand that it's now an age of different types of expertise. Um, just my two cents. Um, okay, let's open it up to the floor. Yes. <coughs> So quick. And then, I mean, I don't think Elon just just pours gas into a rocket and lets it go. Elon doesn't just pour gas into a rocket and lets it go. So he and his team think through what happened in the past that worked and why there might be ways to improve, etc. So whatever you want to call planning a thing before you do it, that's what I'm advocating for and looking at what you currently do. So whether it's design thinking, process mapping, whatever name you want to give it, I think um, obviously the journey is important, but you do have to think through um, what the problem is, identify the problem, and how, do, how can it be solved, and what are some options to solve it, and then track results. So when he used to look at the result, like, this rocket failed. What did we do here, and how can we change that? That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, okay. yeah. And, and that's the basic process that technology companies uh, take with any of their products, right? So we're used to thinking that way. Yeah. You do a thing, you find out where it worked, where it didn't work, you correct, you try again, you correct, you try again, and that's how you make them. Whatever that is, perfect. is what I'm advocating yeah. for. Yeah. Iteration or continuous improvement. Yeah. Any Whatever. of those words work, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Let me, let me pick up, pick that up, if I have uh, understood your question correctly. So how do we uh, overcome certain attributes which, which belong to the older generation? How do we foster or support these, these new attributes? That, that was your question, right? Yeah, it is, you know, the magic is we don't have to do anything because it's just there. These people haven't been trained by us to perform in these surveys in a way that they are less skeptical and less aggressive and less. They are educated by me as a father or by, by other people of my generation. And th these are the people who come, who grow up in a different background, no war behind them, mostly no poverty, no, you know, that. So, and they are as they are. And for me, the important part of your question would be how do we support? these traits and attributes in an atmosphere and environment which is basically completely different, which does not cater and does not appraise these personality traits as something which gets a bonus or makes a career or makes it up to partnership, because that what I call the culture clash between the traditional way of thinking in a partnership and a new ways of people who say, don't know whether you remember my top teams list, or number two or three was away with partnerships. We want to have a corporate because a corporate stands for more fairness in treating different people. While the partnership is this group of mostly men deciding on the next generation, which all of a sudden looks exactly like, like, like them. So what I'm saying is the main challenge is in a law firm which, law, which every law firm has a traditional background, how to change the systems in the law firm to allow for, for new, diverse cultural backgrounds, 
people backgrounds, gender backgrounds, ethical backgrounds. That you know, we in Germany we, we don't talk so much about gender because that has not yet arrived. Yeah. Yet. We are proud if we get it right with gender diversity. Um, so, and I would very much like to hear from John, for example, what Dentons does in a firm, if it doesn't just blow up everything, in a firm like Dentons with in, in all corners of the world and still growing and still organically growing, how your firm is managing to do that. Because if that process is not managed, these people will turn away and will find other employers because they are very good, they are very creative, they have a good sense of humor and a good personality, so it's fun to work with them. So if law does not offer or cater for these personalities, then it's getting pretty dull. <laughs> so, John, how... <laughs> how <laughs> Solve the problems. <laughs> how, yeah. I mean, well, you know, it's a very interesting conversation, and I think, um, you know, the way we're trying to approach it, frankly, is um, um, we have a, a, a extremely talented chief talent officer who has built out a very robust set of uh, leadership training initiatives uh, that really focus on uh, bringing some of the best uh, thinking in terms of how they build teams, how to bring in uh, you know, neuroscience, uh, behavior science, and, and actually help elevate the quality of leadership and management skills that our uh, partners have, as well as other business service leaders who are trying to address those kinds of issues. And really focus on, you know, you know, I, I just had this conversation with someone yesterday, one of the, one, to me, one of the most um, interesting things about my job is when I'm going to different parts of the world where we have, you know, meetings in, in our various locations, it just, you know, blows me away the differences. And unlocking that. That's a great answer. Uh, David, you had a uh, comment you wanted to make. Well, to, to, to bring this uh, conversation kind of back to that pipeline problem of how, you know, how, do, we, how do we bring in the right kinds of students and, right. uh, and get them on the path, I mean, there, 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 there's a combination of carrots and sticks that you could use here, right? I mean, the, one of the carrots would, would be to make more well-defined roles um, that would, would would clearly be of interest to the students coming out of Dan Linnett's program, for example, at Michigan State, or you know, any of the other uh, programs like here, where, where they're catering to students interested in, in crossing these disciplines between technology and, and law. Um, but, but part of the problem is also just the way we frame the, the whole enterprise of, of law and law school. Um, you know, we, sort of these conferences, we spend a lot of time talking about what, what would scare away a young student. You know, like why would I want to go into that field uh, given its current state? But there are students, I think, that would, would look at that and say, wow, what a challenge. Look, there's, a, there's an industry that's a real mess and, and, and right. my skills can fix this. Right. And so uh, somehow we need to make a bridge to, go to those students that will see it as, a, as, a, as an advantage uh, yeah. of the current state. And I, I also think it's important, and John mentioned this in his presentation, um, being risk adverse is not a bad thing um, either. And you know, I don't, I don't think all of a sudden we have to throw out everything that made a lawyer a lawyer as well. So you know, we have to issue spot, et cetera. So I just think that it's, instead of thinking, well, if I am this way, I can't be any other way that needs to go out the door. And you know, I was an attorney, but I was an entrepreneur, and I'm both. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it is what it is. So I just think um, we also have to be careful not just, like I said, just grabbing the stuff around us and running out the door really quick. Now everyone's gonna be an entrepreneur. No, like there's like, let's plan it through. And I, I think 
Um, yes, in high doses, it's negative, but we also have to approach our work and what makes a lawyer um, a trustworthy person who people go to to solve their issues is their legal training, their problem solving, and their experience, and that's all very important. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to, s oh, go ahead, Mark, please, first. So we, we recently had a, did quite an interesting thing, which is we had um, one of our clients, an associate from one of our clients, uh, come do a secondment with us at Diligent. Um, and so he was working with us for a while, and um, you know, he made a lot of observations about what was different about the law firm environment to the you know, technology company environment. And one of his uh, comments was um, definitely around that he was so surprised to see that you know when we sat down as a team to make a decision, there were like a few lawyers there, but there were also software engineers, machine learning engineers, there were business people, there were marketing people, and we all sat down and said, what problem are you facing? And we all tried to solve the problem, even if it wasn't our area, and yeah. especially if it wasn't our area. Um, and that actually leads to some surprising solutions. I've had you know business and marketing problems solved by software engineers because sometimes there is a technolo technological solution that you just don't know exists, yes. right? Um, and that's where you know, and that's something I really love about our company. And it, it's not that you, you you need to take the lawyerliness out of the lawyers. It's just you know, as soon as you get a group together that has different skill sets, different viewpoints, different expertise, um, you get a stronger solution overall, right? I think that's a great point. And uh, to that, uh, to, to, to put it, maybe even an exclamation point on that great point, uh, I think that um, we, um, uh, David had mentioned clock. And you know that's come up during the course of this conference. Um, and you know the interesting thing, though, is that if you look past all the enthusiasm, and you look past the buzz of corporate legal operations, and you look at what's really going on and what kind of influence they have within most legal departments, um, you will see that it's quite limited. Um, and I think that is the culture issue again. Um, and to your point, Laura, I totally agree with you that I think where clients' interests will uh, be uh, advanced uh, the most uh, thoroughly and quickly is those organizations that do what your organization does, which of course is very different because in many uh, law firms, let's be honest about it, um, technologists are sort of the redheaded stepchildren uh, within the organization legal ops people to the extent that they exist are tolerated um, and they're more window dressing than they are in most firms truly you know an integral part of the decision making process of how best to deliver and with that in terms of you know the structure and the partnership structure versus the corporate structure i'd like to just pose a question to you david on this one um, we haven't talked much about you know so-called alternative uh, legal providers. Um, I think we could come up with a much better name for them because they're no longer alternative. They are very mainstream. Um, most of those organizations um, ha have the kind of composition, Laura, that you are talking about. Um, they have legal expertise, but they also have other forms of expertise required. Um, and they also have corporate structures. So I'm wondering, David, if you could just talk a little bit about your uh, thoughts on, you know, uh, these kinds of providers, um, and you know, they also have different re reward systems, right? Um, you can have stock, you can have outside investment, um, and so on and so forth. If you could just comment on that a little, and how you see that sort of uh, in the bigger picture discussion that we're talking about. Sure, and I, and I think that's I think that's that's key because we we continue to sort of talk about um, law firms as the as the paradigm right. for for the legal industry or the legal practice, and and as we speak, it's moving away from that. Uh, we're moving away from a law firm centric industry to a much more multimodal industry, if you will, where 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 corporate uh, GC. GCs and their organizations are taking on more power and more operations and and alternative providers as well. Um, Marcus was nice enough to throw up a slide from that a study we did uh, two years ago and we're currently fielding a, an update to it um, about uh, alternative legal service providers. And I think really what the, 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 the truly interesting finding that we came up with out of that study was that 
um, in the course of a few years, the buyers of those services, whether they're corporations or in some cases law firms themselves, uh, are, are increasingly seeing the purchase of those services as uh, an, an added value rather than just a, a, a cost reduction method. Uh, you know, when, when, when outsourcing firms first came along, it was all about shipping, uh, you know, shipping labor to a cheaper labor market. Um, but increasingly, the, the combination of those, uh, those providers uh, using technology, using cheaper humans, and using different sets of skills to solve legal problems has, has turned them into a value to the point where even law firms say, okay, there are certain classes of matters that we can't keep the expertise around on a full-time basis to, to cover. But we have good relationships with alternative providers and we can, we can bring that work to those people and that, that adds value to our clients. Yeah. So I think that's a, that's a big dynamic that's going on here is that it, we're not just shifting you know, dollars around, we're, we're sort of shifting the, the whole value proposition around a little bit. Yeah. And, and, and to that I would just say that it, it seems to me that uh, we're undergoing a shift now where you know, traditional notions of what a law firm was as this self-contained entity that did everything on its own. Now they're starting to collaborate. Um, you see example, one example would be um, uh, Alan and Obrey, the, 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 the famous um, uh, firm, Magic Circle firm, um, has collaborated with Deloitte. Uh, and you see instances where um, uh, you have vast swaths of uh, an in-house legal department. Recently, uh, General Electric uh, sent about 200 of its uh, legal department over to a so-called alternative uh, service provider. I prefer to use the term uh, law company, United Lex. Um, United Lex took over a vast portion of General Electric's law department, and I hope I'm not speaking out of school here, but um, it's going so well that even more of the General Electric Law Department might well be going over to United Lex. So I think that the traditional notions of, you know, sort of the marketplace are starting to shift. And my personal hope is that that is emblematic of the kind of cultural shift that we're all talking about during this conference and, and uh, hope will continue. Um, more questions from the audience? Yeah. is that we hear all the time that law firms are slow to change and don't want to adopt technology and and we see it from a very different perspective you know all day every day I deal with firms and legal departments who very much want to change and are very interested in adopting technology and um, you know I, and all of those I would say is not just small victories those are each of those is a big victory because each time um, each time one company changes, it influences all of the others. That influences their clients. You know, it, 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 there's a knock-on effect. And so I'd say we've got, we've got more than small victories um, and have for, for some time. Andrew, do you want to Yeah, I think, I think um, what I'm noticing is very much the same. I think being able to be the first portfolio company that got to work with Nextel Labs and a whole bunch of amazing things that you know, going through Y Combinator, et cetera, and gaining a lot of like um, some of the best law firms in the world, in-house teams, et cetera, has been fabulous. Um, but I think the small victories are still, and I'm not saying that, um, I still think we're making a lot more small victories, so maybe this is a different point, Laura, from, from what you're seeing. But what I'm seeing is that when you work with a large organization, you don't work with all 9,000 lawyers at Dentons. 
you work with the pocket and the innovators, and if you work with a law school, if you work with an in-house team, you deal with, like you mentioned earlier, those people who are driving the change. So I think those are the small victories because the large victories is gonna be when every single lawyer at, you know, name the top AMLAW 100, know about tools like Diligent, know about tools like Ross, and I'm talking about from the bottom up, that would be a large change. But um, I think the small victories are occurring on a daily basis. Um, and obviously we work to publicize that as much as we can so that you do have a movement where folks know that it's okay to innovate and okay to change. Uh, but I don't see as much as you'd want, you know, um, and Dan mentioned his frustrations just from an academic standpoint, and I think this is the same in all of our different institutions. We know who within our organizations are open to these things and we work with them. That's a small victory. I see the future being us working with everyone at an organization, and that's what we look forward to as an organization. Um, our goal, as I always say, is you know we want Ross to be on the, the legal team of every lawyer in the world, and um, that's going to obviously come with a lot of scrapes and bruises and scars. And uh, good thing that I'm young, but I'm getting a lot more gray hair, so we'll see how it goes. Just wait. Um, uh, let's um, let's take about ten more minutes. We've got a few uh, 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 questions left. Um, I, I think you know probably it's Friday. I know we have a number of people from out of town who are trying to catch flights, so. Uh, and it's almost lunchtime, so um, how about if we take a couple more questions, and um, yes? Marcus, you want to take a shot? No, I wasn't sure. I really understood the question. Yeah. Um, so it, is your question that, you know, given the fact that you are uh, in this program uh, that embraces your background um, in STEM and whatnot, and now that you're going to be finished and going in the marketplace, are you going to have to wait 20 years for market acceptance? Is that your question? Yeah, kind of like how we position ourselves. Right. Okay, so, so Marcus, I guess I frame it as, you know, from a personal branding perspective, uh, what counsel might you be able to give um, to this young woman and others like her who, you know, are going through these uh, innovative programs, but they're sort of like the first in the market uh, to do this. And the market may not quite yet understand the full value of what it is that they can bring to the table. Um, I would recommend shop around yeah. um, and don't take the first offer you get or even if you may think oh wow that that'll take a quarter back from my debt that's probably not the best offer you have the, the issue is and that's what I understand at the background of your question we we have on the one hand a high level of activity and innovation and, 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 and all that stuff and on the other hand a great degree of intransparency. So we don't really know who the innovative firms are where people like you are really welcome. We know who works with Ross because it's on your homepage, but um, for other people it's hard to identify where to go. So um, what we probably need is a sort of database or data collection on law firms where young innovative people could go to. These are probably not the usual suspects of the big law firms which offer you a fixed career path and a decent salary. Um, for Germany, I would expect look around in smaller firms and you will have, maybe you will find there what, you, uh, what you're looking for. And what we tell our Wuzerio students very often is look outside law firms. Not in-house departments, but look outside law firms. And there is a, a significant percentage of Bucerius uh, students who set up their own startup firm, either as a technology firm or as an, as an alternative um, law firm 
trying to combine new ways of providing legal services. Um, but there is no list of firms I could give to you and say, look, there are the phone numbers, try to, um, try to phone them. I'm sorry, so really shop around yeah. and then look around. Yeah, and, and, and I would just, you know, to put a, a, a gloss on what Marcus said, um, or to repeat what he said is, don't just limit yourself to the traditional paradigm of a law firm, or even an in-house department. That uh, some of these law companies, for example, I think might be my response to where you might want to look. Or, or smaller startups, or right. larger uh, you know, legacy companies that are always looking for people. So, so and, Thomson and it, Reuters has a, <laughs> a job for you. That was like, aren't you glad you well, asked? What I'm trying to say is it's, yeah. a, it's a... You get a job, you get a job. <laughs> Everyone gets a job! <laughs> it's, a, it's a big tent, and I think, right. again, I want to emphasize that the, the, the whole... One important thing to take away from all this is to not think of the legal services industry as being the law firm industry. It's not the same yeah, thing. Right. There's a lot of different types of players. We're all active in this. We're all interested in you know new kinds of talent. So definitely. If you work for Ross, you get a shirt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, he's got that. The going best T-shirts. Um, I would say if you're looking at uh, firms or more traditional outfits. Um, when you see the headlines um, and you, those different groups, that's great. Those are a great jump off point. But when you're going through the interview process, ask them questions about what they are actually doing in those programs. Yeah. And the same would apply to, even I, I tell high school students that about law schools, et cetera. Be like, okay, name three of the last projects you went through and name, and let me know how did that get rolled out to the firm, et cetera, et cetera. And ask those questions because A, it's gonna make you seem like you're informed. Um, and also just, you'll get the right information so you don't just wind up um, kind of back at square one, which you don't want to. Yeah, and, and, and I think maybe that would, your question, you know, because you are the future, um, and I think that maybe that, that's, a, that, that's a great way to kind of end up on the future, right? Not what was, but what's going to be. Um, so um, I just want to um, thank um, the law school, the dean. I'd like to thank Julian, give a shout out to Julian and to her team who have done a great job. <laughs> Of putting on this program. Um, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for uh, attending. I hope you felt that it was time well spent. Um, at the very least, you got some free meals and you know, uh, uh, and, and you had the opportunity to uh, meet you know, some, some uh, of really the leaders in the industry, the leaders and doers. Um, and most of all, I would like to thank the speakers. Um, who are all my friends, um, and I, I don't use that term lightly, they are colleagues and they are friends. Each one of them, you know, has one or more day jobs. Um, they have traveled, you know, in some instances, most instances, from a great distance um, at, to join us. Um, I think you will agree with me that, um, you know, it was just a great, great opportunity to spend time with them, to hear their thoughts. Um, so thank you all very much for doing this. Um, and uh, I hope we get to do it again. So. And uh, a round of applause for Mark. Yeah, Patrick Gulley.